Yarmouk camp in Damascus. Uh, actually, the Lebanese authorities have already registered about 2,000 of those refugees coming from the Yarmouk camp. It started with, in the wake of the um, acquittal of several police officers in the murder of Sean Bell, the police are to watch a certain independent black mosque. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 22 channels from Vermont to New York City. On the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. We begin with an Al Jazeera report on Palestinian refugees who are being attacked and fleeing from their homes, this time in Syria. They're moving by the thousands into uncertainty in Lebanon. Then to a talk by a prison abolitionist. She says we can and must get rid of prisons. Her name is Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Her recent book about the boom in California prisons is called Golden Gulag. Finally to South Africa where a former anti-apartheid activist is now a wealthy businessman and part owner of the mines where the recent massacre of miners took place. He is now advancing in the South African government. We begin at Yarmouk camp in Syria, where the Palestinians are being bombed by the Syrian Air Force and attacked by the sectarian rebels. One should point out that the Assad regime never used its air force to liberate its Golan Heights, only to attack its own citizens and the Palestinians. The United Nations Refugee Agency is asking for a billion dollars to help refugees who are fleeing the violence in Syria. The UN says more than a million Syrians could head into neighboring countries during the first half of 2013. That is double the current number across the region in Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, North Africa and Lebanon. Mohammed Val is at the Jalil refugee camp in Lebanon's Beka Valley and uh, tell us about the conditions those there are having to endure at what is clearly a pretty cold time of year. Sorry David, can you repeat that question? There was some noise behind me. Yeah, I say it looks pretty cold. Uh, how bad is it going to be for them if the weather worsens? Yeah, David, it's very difficult condition here for these uh, Palestinian refugees. We've been, in the last several months, we've been talking about Syrian refugees, but now we have Palestinian refugees coming from Syria after those clashes that took place uh, in Yarmouk camp in Damascus. Uh, actually, the Lebanese authorities have already registered about 2,000 of those refugees coming from the Yarmouk camp. Very difficult conditions, as you mentioned, the cold and also the lack of shelter because the Lebanese authorities did not want to create a new camp for them uh, and they have just to fend off themselves or they have to, in, uh, they have to uh, be hosted by families here inside uh, Lebanon. We are now in a refugee camp uh, in Al Biqa' Valley. It's a small refugee camp already crowded with Palestinians. And yet we have already 550 families who came to this camp alone. And uh, people here have a problem handling this situation. The uh, United Nations uh, Agency for Palestinian Refugees has only started, just today, started to distribute some help, some aid, some blankets, uh, some kitchen uh, ware to these people. But people here are telling us this is far from enough and they need more to help these Palestinians. Possibly, Mohammed, it, it's not reflective of the treatment of refugees on the whole in other countries as well. But, but give me the position of the Lebanese government when it comes to those who come in from Syria. Are they prepared to help? Are, are they welcoming them? Well, uh, apparently they, 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 they are not against the idea of having more of the Palestinian refugees. We've been today to one of the border crossings and uh, people finally get, uh, get to Lebanon. They have difficulties. They have to pay uh, some money in order they have to, each individual has to pay $17 to get inside. They have to have a stamp already on their passports or on their papers by the Syrian authorities. Those who did not have the approval of the Syrian authorities to get into Lebanon, they cannot get into Lebanon. So that's already a problem. Lebanon has been complaining that it cannot handle 
the problem of the Palestinian refugees or even the Syrian refugees uh, for that matter and they have been asking for funds from the UN and from other uh, uh, organizations to help them do this so if that come if that help doesn't come probably they will have a problem you, you remember Lebanon has already a lot of Palestinian refugees actually hundreds of thousands of them already here they have been here since uh, since three decades now and the, the last thing they need to see is more refugee camps being built inside Lebanon for the Palestinians. Mohammed, thank you very much indeed. Mohammed Val there in the Bekaa Valley close to the Syrian border. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is a professor of geography at Rutgers. She spoke in Connecticut at the conference of the Connecticut Coalition to oppose indefinite detention. You'll see part of her talk at a panel and then more informal remarks at a workshop. I'm going to talk about the criminals um, because your innocence will not save you, as Nancy's remarks should have indicated by now. And I will talk about a couple of um, actions that have happened in California recently to give um, meat to my observation. In the California state prisons, Recently, over the last couple of years, at the same time that North Africa and West Asia were exploding into well-documented in the mainstream media in the USA uprisings, there was an uprising that was organized as a hunger strike. This uprising was organized by prisoners who are in indefinite detention inside prison. So they're already convicted, they're doing time, and then they're doing time indefinitely inside the prison. They're in a prison in the prison. They're in what's called the security housing unit, which some of you might know about. It's a form of imprisonment that was innovated in the former West Germany, where in the absence of a death penalty, the um, uh, forces of uh, both state and, and corrections in West Germany were trying to figure out how to wipe out the Red Brigade. They had caught the Red Brigade, they had tried and convicted those people, but they couldn't execute them because they didn't have a death penalty. And the purpose of the shoe was to induce death in the people locked in it. And that is what it does. It makes people crazy. Everybody knows that it is a violation of human rights to keep anybody in solitary confinement for more than 15 days. And there are people who have been in the security housing unit in California for 15 and more years. Years and they can never get out. There's one man I know I've talked to many times who's been in the hole since 1973. The prisoners in the security housing unit are divided by race and region, and this is part of the deliberate plan uh, uh, by the California Department of, Direction, of Corrections, Directions and Corrections, to keep people apart inside. The department innovated this process not just as a reflection of the divisions outside, even though we know that the U.S. is more segregated by race and class now than it was in 1960, they innovated this kind of division inside to break apart radical prisoner organizing that was the hallmark of prisons in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, as many of you might know, either from memory or from study. And in dividing the prisoners into these groupings by race and region, they effectively established prison gangs inside and then fomented warfare between them. They did this, the Department of Corrections, in order to get the prisoners' minds off the oppressor, the guards, and onto each other. That plus television worked. It worked very well. So the prisoners have been in the hole now for decades and decades and decades. They put forward demands in, um, uh, that their hunger strike was uh, the, the force behind, asking for rather simple, straightforward things. They asked for a way to get out of indefinite detention without doing one of three things, which are the only way to get out now. You snitch, you parole, or you die. Right? They said, we don't want to snitch. Many of us will never parole. We're doing life. And we don't want to die in the hole. So give us a way to get out. They asked for adequate nutrition, because as the prison system has grown and grown, it's figured out ways to squeeze, and it's totally public. It's totally public, it's totally public, write that down. It's figure out ways to squeeze resources out of the bodies of prisoners so that the resources that, that circulate through the prison will circulate mostly in the form of wages to both guard and non-guard staff and to pay the utilities that keep those cities running, because a prison is a city. 
And the prisoners asked for some other things as well. The Department of Corrections cavalierly um, refused to meet the prisoners' demands and offered a counterproposal that was insulting uh, 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 at best. However, tens of thousands of prisoners throughout the California state system and some in systems beyond California joined the hunger strike in solidarity with those in the security housing unit. When the Department of Corrections response came out, the department, of course, then hunkered down for some kind of violent uprising. That's not what happened, not surprisingly. The prisoners who are in solitary confinement, who actually spend 23 hours a day locked in their, in their cells, who sometimes get to go one hour a day and walk up and down in a little pen that you wouldn't even put your dog into if you had a dog to put in a pen, people who have never seen the horizon in all the years that they've been uh, locked up, those people put together a new set of demands. And their new demands, instead of going uh, vertically up to their keepers, were sent out horizontally to everybody else locked up in all the communities that they came from. And they sent out demands uh, uh, horizontally to end the hostilities between the races. This is huge. It's huge because the people who have been locked inside, who have in one way or another, wittingly or not, participated in the race and ethnic war that the department fomented in order to secure itself as a department, have now seen and refused to be participants in that anymore and have sent word out to the communities they come from to do the same kind of thing. This is a very frightening thing in the United States of America where our division is always very important for the security of racial capitalism and the contemporary neoliberal state. So I call that to your attention. The second case I want to give, um, describe to you very briefly are gang injunction zones. And these are places that are outside of prisons and jails. They are in communities. It is a form of spatial control that is enacted through civil law, not criminal law, civil law. And what civil law does is to divide up the spaces of the communities, of the cities and municipalities and neighborhoods, where people who have been convicted of certain crimes, some of their associates and some of their associates' associates are forbidden to go. Now, many people imagine that what gang injunctions do is keep you know, uh, uh, low income, mostly male, uh, persons of color out of, say, gentrified areas. That's not what it does. Divides up people and separates people from their communities, from their neighborhoods, from their streets, from their households, from their families. That's what gang injunctions do. So people have been organizing all over the United States to fight against gang injunctions, and I don't have time to give you the history of gang injunctions, but it goes pretty much hand in hand with the history of the security housing unit that I laid out for you in the case of the California uh, Department of Corrections. Now, uh, as I think I said earlier, and if I didn't, I should have said, and I'll say again, innocence doesn't save anybody. So making an argument that one is not a criminal, and therefore we know who the criminals are, is not going to save one single person, none of the people we advocate for, and certainly not, our, not ourselves. Because if an injury to one is an injury to, to all, that means, among other things, that the criminalization of one is the criminalization of all, and we should take that seriously. I see that my good friend Fahd Ahmed is here, and he is going to be speaking this afternoon, and he might bring up in greater detail what I will describe to you very briefly. The New York City Terrorism Interdiction Unit, not unlike the Boston one that Nancy was describing, um, good, that Nancy was describing, um, that unit, uh, uh, somebody inside that unit, leaked to us on the outside a one day brief from that unit to the chief of police, to Ray Kelly. On that one day brief, one single day, it's 2008, right, Fine, Like April something, 2008. It started with, in the wake of the um, acquittal of several police officers in the murder of Sean Bell, the police are to watch a certain independent black mosque. Then it goes through critical resistance, Desi's rising up moving moving, um, uh, the Gina 6, which is in Louisiana. It mentions by name a number, number of people in critical resistance and uh, in other organizations. It goes on for two and a half pages. And toward the end, 
The target is Muslim student organizations in the City University of New York and particularly a vacation that a group of students took that one of the spies went along on, where they went upstate in New York, went rafting, prayed, and talked about religion. That's one day's report. So the connection between all of us and the impossibility of making a bright line between criminalist, uh, people who have been convicted of crimes and those who haven't uh, should be apparent. Civil death stalks the land. Human rights might be the response to civil death, as Malcolm X argued, but that answer has got to be aspirational civil uh, uh, human rights in the form of abolition, not the scientific sort of human rights that is being practiced today as though there were a technical response to every problem. I.L. Weitzman calls the kind of, of human rights that are being practiced today that, that condone 29 people being killed by a drone, but not 31, lawfare, and we cannot uh, succumb to lawfare in order to try to read, reach our goals. Innocence is no defense. Abolition is the only offense against the human sacrifice that brought us here together today. Thank you. Because the United States is completely out of step with the planet. With the planet. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The United States is out of step with the planet when it comes to sentencing, when it comes to criminalization, when it comes to the fact that what you are convicted of and the punishment that's attached to that conviction never ends, right? It never ends for many, many people. So I gave the example in my morning remarks about gang injunctions, right? That's an example, but only one of punishment that never ends. Or if we compare the United States with a good deal of the world, and I have slides, I can show you pictures yeah. if you want to know. Um, with a good deal of the world, you will see that the length of sentences in the United States are completely out of whack with the rest of the world. So not only is the US out of whack with a good deal of its um, peer uh, nation states, most of which do not have and have not had for a long time, in some cases more than a century, the death penalty, they don't have life sentences, right? They have life sentences only, I mean, judges have to have special tribunals to keep somebody in prison for longer than 15 years. And there has to be, you know, this huge review and the constitutional courts have to agree and da da da. It happens once in a blue moon, right? The United States, Lousy with less death sentences, lousy with life without parole, lousy with uh, man, uh, minimum, mandatory minimums, get the M's backward, for all kinds of things. So let us not waste our time together here today saying, isn't it the nonviolent drug users who really should be out of prison? The problem is prison. And the reason the nonviolent drug users are in prison is because all the other stuff has been normalized, right? So that when my colleague on the panel talked about that memorandum that, uh, uh, that was under consideration by the Obama administration to focus deportation on quote unquote criminals as against people just living their lives, what do you think people do when they get out of prison? They live their lives. They live their lives. They are, they are many kinds of person. They are not only the person who was convicted. They live their lives. So to, to imagine that the deportation jumping on people who may have been convicted, did their time, got out, and are living their lives is somehow more just than other deportations, think about it. Think about it. This is how racism works. Even if the two people that we're talking about seem to be identical, this is how racism works. You shorten a life, right? Shorten a life, and it's group differentiated. That's how it works. And indeed, in the United States, it's behind the sturdy curtain of anti-black racism, as well as the sturdy curtain now of anti-Muslim racism, even though Muslims are various races, right? That all of this has proceeded. So that today, right, one in 100 adults in the United States is locked up. One in 100. Think about that. One out of every hundred adults is locked up right this second as we speak. Half of them are black people, but that means half of them are not. 
Okay? Half of them are, half of them are not. Half of them are, but maybe two thirds are black and brown. That means a third are not. And most of that third are white folks. Right? They're poor, working class, pretty much across the board. Indeed, who's in prison? Modestly educated people in the prime of their life. Who should be in labor unions? Modestly educated people in the prime of their life. Right? So when we talk about the shift away from labor unions and the rise of prisons, we can think about the problem of worklessness as part of what cre created the entire problem that abolitionists seek to address in the first place. Now, here's the problem that we face when we try to talk to people about the prison industrial complex. People want a tidy little sound bite, right? It's true for everything. People want a tidy little sound bite because we've been barraged over a long time. I was born in the middle of the last century, 1950, the day after the census, so I wasn't counted in the 1950 census. Census was April 1, I was born April 2. People want a little phrase that is well turned that seems to explain everything. So the other side, the proponents of prison and criminalization say, crime went up, we cracked down, crime came down. It's neat, isn't it? Yeah. It's persuasive, isn't it? It's very um, tidy and easy to repeat, isn't it? It's also not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's as untrue as the weapons of mass destruction that were hidden all over Iraq that justified that war. It's equally untrue. What happened in the United States is crime did go up from the late 60s uh, through the 70s at, a, at the same time that jobs for modestly educated people began to disappear at a phenomenal rate. And then crime started to come down. It all peaked in 1980, not 1990. Many, some of you weren't even born in 1980, right? Not 1990, not 2000, and so forth. 1980. And then crime came down, and then they started cracking down. Because in the shift from, however weak, a more or less socially responsible welfare type state to what we have now, the state that organizes the abandonment of the people least able to protect and take care of themselves, in that shift, those who seized or wanted to keep state power looked around and said, how can we justify having any state power? And the answer was, we will say that the legitimate use of state power at every, any level, federal, state, state, city, county, municipality, will be defense, both international and local. That's policing and prisons in the, in the domestic case and then the military everywhere else, right? And then fiscal policy. So that's it. And having seen the trend, crime go up, crime go down, they began to take credit for something they do not get the credit for, in fact, and started to build prisons to sort of follow, not lead, the decline in crime. This is all in my book, so you should buy my book and read it, and then you'll understand. And even though in my book the focus is California, the patterns for the United States are actually quite similar. There's not, there's not a huge difference. But they're mostly similar, interestingly enough, in states like New York and Connecticut, big state and small state, and all the way around down through the southeast, the south and up through the southwest, which had been central in the military industrial complex. It's what some of us call the gun belt. The gun belt. So Connecticut's part of the gun belt, right? New Haven. I'm a New Haven native. What did New Haven produce for a long, long time? Students and guns, right? It produced the people who dreamed up the foreign policy to decide who to kill with the guns. Yeah. The people who dreamed up the colonial policy to decide who to colonize with the guns. Now to South Africa, where some of the fighters against apartheid have become big businessmen and exploiters of labor. President Jacob Zuma's landslide win was expected. So too was the political comeback of business tycoon Cyril Ramaphosa. The ruling ANC has been plagued by infighting and factionalism. Their supporters hope this will help stabilize the party.
by electing Jacob Zuma, it was also, it was not in the form of leading the ANC, it was also by rescuing the ANC from those people who are counter-revolutionaries who wanted to take the ANC and change the ANC to be their own thing. Ramaphosa left politics in the mid-1990s to pursue a career in business. He's done well and is said to be the second richest black South African. His appointment as deputy president of the ruling party gives him more influence. The business community will likely be pleased about Cyril Ramaphosa's appointment. They're hoping that he'll push through market-friendly policies that could stabilize South Africa's economy. Ramaphosa's image was tainted in August when police shot and killed 34 striking miners. He's a shareholder at Lonman Platinum Mine, where the shooting took place. The incident showed the appalling conditions in which mine workers live and work. Ironically, Ramaphosa was once one of the leaders of the National Union of Mine Workers. He is being seen as a bourgeoisie uh, on the ground and somehow anti-workers. Um, his ability to overcome that in terms of rebranding himself, speak the language, but the language that he has to speak is the delivery language. His ability to really quick wins in terms of delivery uh, if he moves into President Jacob Zuma's government, I think that will make him gain um, support both in the party as well as in the, in the country and globally. If the ANC wins the 2014 general election, Ramaphosa could become deputy president of the country. South Africans will be waiting to see where the new ANC leadership plans to take the party and the country. Haru Mutasa, Al Jazeera, Bloemfontein. In closing, when you go to our website, you can see how to link up with us with Facebook and Twitter. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.